Welcome to tonight's conversation, The Heart of the Matter, Two Rabbis Discuss Love in the Jewish Tradition, featuring Rabbis Sharon Brous and Shai Held, moderated by Stephanie Butnick. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event, which concludes the 2024 season of Unpacking the Book, Jewish Writers in Conversation. Co-presented by the Jewish Museum, Jewish Book Council, and Tablet Magazine. It's been a great season of conversations, and if you missed any of them, they're available to watch on the Jewish Book Council's YouTube page. I would like to take this opportunity to thank collaborators at both organizations for all their work putting together these thoughtful author pairings, with a special thank you to Evie Sapphire Bernstein for all her work on this season's programming. Closed captioning is available tonight for those who wish to use it. Simply click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen to watch the event with captions turned on. Now, before we begin, I would like to introduce Naomi Firestone Peter, CEO of Jewish Book Council, to share a little bit more about tonight's program. Thank you so much, Jenna, as always. I'm pleased to be able to welcome you tonight on behalf of Jewish Book Council. We're thrilled to present Unpacking the Book for its 10th year in partnership with the Jewish Museum and Tablet Magazine. Each program we've offered in the series brings together authors who approach similar subject matter through their own unique lens. Tonight, we will be exploring love as the core of the Jewish tradition and how to show up for each other in times of joy and struggle with authors Rabbi Sharon Brous and Rabbi Shai Held, who each explore this subject in their recently published books, The Amen Effect and Judaism is About Love. They'll be joined by our brilliant moderator, Stephanie Butnick. Tonight's conversation is a meaningful addition to our work at Jewish Book Council of educating, enriching, and strengthening the community through literature. To learn more about all of our efforts, to find reviews, essays, and our book club resources, to learn about our author tours, our literary journal, Paper Brigade, and our literary awards, including the National Jewish Book Awards, I hope you'll visit our website and even become a member to support all of our work to uplift and celebrate Jewish voices and stories. Before I pass things over to Stephanie, I'd like to very, very quickly thank the Jewish Museum and specifically Jenna and our media sponsor, Tablet Magazine. And a very special thank you as well to Evie from our team, who's our program director and has been managing all the ins and outs of this program. And I'm especially grateful to JBC's board of directors for their continued support of Jewish literature, ideas, and conversation. Finally, I hope if you haven't already, that you'll purchase both of our author's books tonight to support their important work. Not only will they be perfect additions to your own home library, but they also make great gifts. And a reminder that you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to our authors throughout today's discussion. And now I'd like to introduce you to Stephanie. Stephanie Butnick is a host of the wildly popular Jewish podcast, Unorthodox, produced by Tablet Magazine where she has worked for more than a decade in various writing and editing roles. She is the co-author of the newest Jewish encyclopedia from Abraham to Zabar's and everything in between, and she helped edit Tablet's first book, The 100 Most Jewish Foods, A Highly Debatable List. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Post. Thank you so much for joining us, and please enjoy the evening. Thank you, Naomi um, and Jenna and Evie. This is really one of my favorite, my favorite events, um, the best, the best series. It's really, really special to be part of it. And I'm, I'm so, I'm so grateful. Um, and thank you to the team of the Jewish Museum and the Jewish Book Council. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with my two interlocutors tonight. You couldn't ask for better panelists. Um, I'm going to read very short descriptions of their bios because they can they have very, very, very big bios. They are very, very impressive. Um, and you can, you'll, you can find them and you're going to hear more from them tonight. But let me introduce my two panelists. Rabbi Sharon Braus is the author of The Amen Effect, Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts and World. She is the founder and founding and senior rabbi of Ikar, a trailblazing Jewish community based in Los Angeles. Rabbi Shai Held is a theologian, educator, author, and his latest book is called Judaism is About Love, Recovering the Heart of Jewish Life. He is president, dean, and chair in Jewish thought at the Hadar Institute in New York City. Welcome, Rabbis Brous and Held. Thank, Thank you. you so, much. so good to be with you. 
it's great to be here. Before we get into like your work, your books, can we talk about where the two of you are? We're on Zoom, so like we're all we're all far flung. Um, Rabbi Brous, please please let us know. I'm I'm sitting in my office in Los Angeles. Not nearly as interesting as where Shai is. So it's 3 p.m. there. So we appreciate you giving like a chunk of your your work day to this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm actually really so I'm so happy to be with you, Stephanie, and connect in this way. And also to Evie and Naomi and Jenna and the whole team there. Um, thank you. And Rabbi Shaheld and I are old, uh, beloved friends, and it's really a, it's a great joy always to talk with Shai. So thank you. From so LA. Shai, you have you have the telltale hotel room blinds. Is that is that my off base? Yes, I am in a <laughs> sports themed hotel in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, you could see the sort of old worn down basket behind me in my room. Um, been here speaking at a psychology conference, but really delighted to be here. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have an excuse to talk to Sharon. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to all of the sponsoring organizations. It's really a pleasure to be here. So this is very exciting for me. These two books are incredible and there will be links in the chat. It could not be easier for you to buy these books. You'll just click on the links that um, the team is dropping in the chat throughout the night. Um, and you'll also get the chance to ask questions. Just drop them in the Q&A box um, and we'll get to them later on. Um, both of these books are, are really, really wonderful and so needed in this moment. Um, and what's exciting for me as a moderator is that like the two of you are real pros. You, you talk all the time, you, you guys, you really know what you're doing. And I think you've actually been in conversation, the two of you about these two books. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, correct. Yeah. Shai, Shai was just out in LA and spoke at Ecar, so we were very, very honored to have him with us. Well, we appreciate you guys doing a warm up for this, um, yeah. and at certain <laughs> I might just like mute myself and let you guys go. So this is like this could not be easier for me. Um, oh, and we have someone here from outside Black Mountain, North Carolina. So, so Shai, someone is someone is near you. Um, everyone's letting us know where they are, which is which is great. Um, and I'm gonna I will tell everyone I'm going to be referring to you by your first names. I have per expressed permission to do so. I respect you both rabbinically, halachically, everything. Um, it's just easier if I don't say rabbi all the time. Um, so, you know, in the opening scene of Love Actually, um, Hugh Grant's voiceover reminds us that love actually is all around. And I, I had always thought he was talking about like the arrivals gate at Heathrow Airport, but it turns out after reading your books, he might be talking about Judaism. So Shai, your book is Judaism is about love. Um, tell us, tell us what this means. Ju Judaism is actually about love. I think was the like the you know was on the on the cutting room floor. Um, but what what does this mean? Like Judaism is about love. What? Right. Well, actually, the original title was Judaism is about love, spelled L-U-V. But I got vetoed <laughs> on that. So, um, you know, the way that I would introduce this book is really by sharing very quickly the story that gave rise to this and that shaped my career in some fundamental way, which was that about two decades ago, I was speaking to a group of senior rabbinical students at one of America's major seminaries. And I said in passing, Judaism is a story of a God who loves us and beckons us to love God back. And one of the students said somewhat sneeringly, I'm sorry, but that sounds like Christianity to me. And that really left me sort of crestfallen and bewildered. And I said to him, it's so interesting that I say that and you think of Christianity because I was thinking of Judaism's twice a day liturgy in which we say, with vast love, have you God loved us? And then we recite Deuteronomy chapter six, and you should love the Lord your God, Be'ahavta. In other words, a God who loves us and beckons us to love God back. So if you hear that and think of Christianity, then one of the conversations we very badly need to have is about how deeply so many Jews, even Jews like you who care a lot and know a lot, have internalized a traditional Christian anti-Judaic idea, which is that Christianity is about love and Judaism is fundamentally loveless. You know, in retrospect, that really gave shape to a lot of what I've tried to do as an educator, as a writer, is simply to try and restore to Judaism what rightfully belongs to it, not to take it away from other people, but to center what I think is, in fact, at the center of Jewish life. It's very odd to me that anyone could read the book of Deuteronomy, for example, and think that Judaism is not about love. So that's really the heart of the project. It's an act of restoration. And, and Sharon, this theme runs through your book. I mean, the subhead is ancient wisdom to mend our broken hearts and world. So how is this 
new way how 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 does how is your book offering a new way for us to look at Judaism at our tradition? So it's a good question. It's not offering a new way. It's offering a very old way. Um, it's I think it's an act of kind of sacred recovery or excavation of our tradition to try to um, to try to share with us part of what is rightfully our Jewish inheritance. So um, the central paradigm in my book is a particular ancient ritual from temple times. It actually appears in a somewhat obscure Mishnah from Midot 2-2, if you're, um, if you're following along in Zafaria. And the Mishnah describes this ritual when hundreds of thousands of Jews used to ascend to Jerusalem, of course, a city on a hill, and then they would climb the steps of the Temple Mount and they would enter through this arched entryway and they would turn to the right and they would circle around the perimeter of the courtyard counterclockwise, hundreds of thousands of people at once on pilgrimage days except for somebody with a broken heart. That person would go up to Jerusalem, would ascend the steps, and they would go through the same entry, but they would turn to the left. And this sacred encounter would happen between the people who were there for their spiritual and religious celebration and the people who were there with their broken hearts. They would see one another. They would have this sacred ritual where the people who were coming in this direction would stop and look into the eyes of the bereft, the bereaved, the ill, the broken, the lonely, and simply ask them, Malach, tell me what happened to you. Tell me about your heart. And that person would answer saying, you know, my father just died and I'm grieving. Or I'm worried sick about my kid and I just need someone to tell me that she's going to be okay. Or I just found a lump and I'm scared out of my mind. And the people who are going in this direction would look into their eyes and offer them a blessing. Something simple like, may the one who dwells in this place hold you with love as you navigate this treatment or as you go through this difficult chapter, may you feel surrounded by community as you adjust to your new reality. And that's it. That's the end of the encounter. And what I realized about, I first encountered this Mishnah when I was in seminary and didn't understand it at all. But I found it again about 10 years later, at 10 years after we had founded Ikar and built this community. And I had married people and helped people through divorce and named babies and buried people. And I found the text and I realized the power of this text is that none of these parties want to be part of this ritual. Because when we're not okay, Misha Erodavar, when something has happened to us, we don't even really want to get out of bed, let alone show up in this place with hundreds of thousands of people and literally walk in the opposite direction from them. Like we all know that feeling when it feels like the whole world's moving this way and we're going this way. And yet we're called out of bed. We're called to show up in this place because we trust that our hearts will be held tenderly by a community that loves us. And when we're on pilgrimage and we're visiting the holiest place on the holiest days and having the holiest experience of our lives, the last thing we want to do is kind of peel away from our family and our friends and our community and say, I got to go check in on that stranger who's coming toward me with, you know, with puffy red eyes because they seem not okay. And yet we realize that's exactly what we're there for. And the reason I felt this was so powerful and speaking so much to our time is because it's essentially the rabbis are calling to us from 2000 years ago, essentially saying it's precisely at the moment that we're most inclined to retreat from one another, that we actually have to find our way toward one another. We have to learn how to re orient our hearts to each other. And that's actually where holiness is born. It's born in that loving encounter that happens when vulnerability meets vulnerability, and we're able to see each other in our fullest humanity. It's really a call in our time to compassion and curiosity and care, but especially when we least are inclined to, to lead with those instincts because we're in so much pain ourselves or we're hurt or we're busy, or we're distracted, or we're full of fear. Because if I meet your vulnerability, it reminds me of my own. And they're saying all that's true. And in any case, you turn toward one another instead of turning away. That's so beautiful. I feel like we could use that ritual like now more than ever, if we could yeah. like, somehow figure out a way to bring that back. You know, you mentioned showing up. Um, and that's such a big theme of, of, of your book and also your work. So tell us a little bit, besides, you know, showing up for this this ritual where everyone is, is present um, in Jerusalem, what, why is it so important that we just show up, that we just start the process of showing up in good times and bad? Tell us a little bit about what you've learned in your pastoral work and also in your, you know, in your in your liturgical work. 
Well, what, I mean, what we know about our time is that we're living through a loneliness epidemic right now. That's what the Surgeon General calls it. I think when I first started talking about loneliness about a decade ago, when I first gave a sermon called The Amen Effect, which was kind of the, you know, the precursor to the book, um, it was, we were just calling it a health crisis. Now we call it an epidemic. Um, people are more isolated. If you're reading the, I'm reading the Jonathan Haidt book right now that, I mean, levels of anxiety are through the roof. We're experiencing a moment of, of massive social crisis right now. And it, it's truly a moment of rupture and we're all experiencing it. We're all, we're all witness to it. And many of us are experiencing it quite personally. And what we know about loneliness, social alienation, isolation, is that it really affects our spirits. I've seen that when I'm pastoring to my community over the last two decades. I see people coming in just broken. And they'll say, I, I feel broken right now. My heart is broken. So we're experiencing it with our spirits as the Surgeon General and others have pointed out in, in a literature that's really, um, gr really emerged in the last decade and a half. It's not only hurting our spirits, it's hurting our bodies. We know now that acute loneliness is essentially the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of the impact on heart and lungs. And Hannah Arendt, the great you know 20th century philosopher, warned us that loneliness and social alienation um, and ideological extremism and isolation from one another are preconditions for tyranny. So it threatens to break our democracy. It's threatening to break our society. And so we're standing in this moment of so much crisis. And normally when we're experiencing crisis, the first thing that we feel we lose, it, the first thing we do lose is our sense of our own power. We feel like it's a massive crisis. There's nothing I can do. And so then we're adding helplessness and hopelessness to the crisis. Um, but actually here, there is something that we can do. And it's rather simple, deceptively simple. We can turn to each other in sorrow, in celebration, and in solidarity. And that very human connection, our human presence, showing up for each other in times of grief and heartache and anguish, turning up and showing up for one another when, when we have moments of joy, and showing up for each other with open hearts to understand and stand with each other in times of real pain can actually rewire us and remind us that we still have agency, especially when the times seem to be conspiring to teach us that we have no agency at all. Stephanie, if, if I could just sort of add one comment to, to Sharon's observation, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, I've always found it extremely interesting that the rabbinic tradition considers showing up for other people in moments of their greatest vulnerability and suffering, essentially the highest level a human being can achieve in this lifetime, right? They consider that walking in God's ways. Godliness, is compassion. And that means, I mean, this is something that's very important to me as well, which is how do we find a way to learn to sit with our fear such that we're capable of loving in the face of our fear? Um, one of the philosophical ideas that I find really helpful is to distinguish between compassion and pity. Compassion is horizontal. When I show compassion, it means that I know that I'm operating on the same level as you and I'm vulnerable just as you are by dint of being human. Pity, in contrast, is vertical. Mm. Pity is based on the illusion that I am immune to what is befalling you. And I think pity is a vice, whereas compassion is the highest virtue. Mm. That's really, really important and, and fundamental. And it, it, it plays exactly in the same direction as what Sharon's been saying. Right. And our instincts, I mean, when I first started talking about this in the community, really as a pulpit rabbi, um, you know, I, I realized a decade into building Ikar that I had never given a sermon about how it is a religious and spiritual obligation to show up for each other, to show up at Shiva, you know, that it really matters because of that instinct to pull away, especially in our moments of greatest need. And I mean, first of all, the data totally bears this out. I mean, we know that people who show up, um, who show up in services once a week or more are likely to live between seven and 13 years longer than people who don't, right? When we show up in intimate community spaces, when we invest in those relationships, it has a real impact on our uh, on our well-being and on our thriving. But we also all know experientially that this is true. Because I, I mean, I can tell you, I just I was just thinking about this the last couple of days, but after my father died just before Rosh Hashanah this past year, 
my one of my friends um, flew from New York to Los Angeles for six hours to come to Shiva. I, I mean, it's a that's a crazy thing to do. And it was the most beautiful gesture of love. And I will remember it for the rest of my life. And so we know what it feels like when people actually show up for us, especially in moments of vulnerability, also in moments of great joy. I have a friend, Julie, who somehow always shows up in the biggest moments of my life. She's there in the front row, like, you know, just cheering me on. I don't know how she always knows about these moments, but she's just always there. And we know what it feels like when people we love don't show up for us and how painful that is. And so we know and understand there's this kind of, there's this psychological and biological reality. We are fundamentally relational beings. We need each other. We especially need each other in moments of vulnerability. And those are the moments when it's scariest to show up. And yet we have to sort of double our efforts to be present in those times. You know, it's so true. Um, it seems like we've almost lost the thread a little bit, right? Like we've lost um, a little bit about how we need to work at these relationships, at community building. And then Shai, in your book, you you really talk about how we've misunderstood um, a lot about, about Judaism. The first words of your book are the very provocative line, Judaism is not what you think it is. Um, so I guess I wanna know like, how did we get to this place where we so misunderstand our tradition and have seeded so much of these things? Even someone in the, in the chat box was like, I think Grace is, uh, Grace is Christian. And like, like, when did we lose all of these things? And I also have to ask you to speak louder. <laughs> okay, I think the this is unfortunately the hotel Wi-Fi because I am talking pretty loud and I see that yeah. people are struggling. I'm gonna do my best. Okay, so let me, let me try to say, uh, um, a couple of things about this. I think that we kind of suffer from a double whammy, if you will. On the one hand, we know from social scientists that minority groups often come to see themselves the way the majority group sees them. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that over the course of Jewish history, Jews internalized in unconscious ways, obviously, what Christians said about them. And the Christian story was that Judaism was a religion without love and that Christ came into the world to fill the lacuna, to sort of provide what was missing. And, you know, when you listen to that for 2000 years, at a certain point, I think you start believing it. Now, I also think that at a certain point in American Jewish history, probably in the wake of World War II, but no one has really studied this, American Jews who were anxious about assimilation and wanted to preserve some form of Jewish identity began to define their Judaism as whatever they imagined Christianity was not. Now, they didn't have a particularly robust understanding of Christianity, so you ended up with these very strange ideas like Judaism has no notion of the afterlife, which generations of Hebrew school students have been taught, but which is not only false, but sort of absurd when you read the sources of the tradition. And I think that is largely because in the understanding of Christianity that American Jews had, Christianity was all about the afterlife. And so Judaism had, quote unquote, no notion of the afterlife. Mm. And since you mentioned grace, Stephanie, I think that's very similar, right? Jews have heard Protestant Christians talk about how Christianity is all about grace. And therefore, they've concluded Judaism must not be about grace. I always find it amazing how something so fundamental to the Jewish tradition can come to seem alien. Let's just take one very quick example of this, right? Maimonides tells us that the fact that there is a world at all and that we are alive within it is an act of grace, meaning none of us ever did anything or could ever have done anything to earn the gifts of life and consciousness. They are pure grace. That's what Maimonides calls them. And yet we find Jews, even knowledgeable Jews saying, well, grace, grace is not a Jewish idea. And yet grace is fundamental. I sometimes like to say Maimonides argues for creation by grace alone, right? That's very, very fundamental to him. Um, actually, you know what, if you'll forgive me, I'll give one other example that is so striking. One of the most powerful moments of the Jewish liturgical year for many American Jews, right, is the moment when we say, or the moments when we say on the high holidays, Avinu malkeinu choneinu vaneinu ki ein banu maasim. Our father, our ruler, show us grace, chain, and answer us. Now wait for it, because we have no deeds, right? It's a different notion of salvation, but that's salvation by grace alone. Answer us, 
because we can't demand it of you. We can only ask it of you. So the point that I really want to make here is that there's this double conspiracy. On the one hand, the majority culture told us that we were loveless. And at the same time, we wanted to distinguish ourselves from the majority culture that we were told was all about love. So we accepted the kind of stereotype or caricature is the better term that said we were loveless. And it's time, it's long past time, I think, to dig out from under that. Um, if I were to say it in a provocative way, which I you know, don't mean to you know, pull us down this, you know, it's an act of decolonization. It is actually encouraging Judaism to free itself from the gaze of Christianity and be itself. That's really what I'm trying to invite people to do, which is kind of reclaim the heart of Jewish life, the heart in both senses of that word, heart as in the core and heart as in our hearts and the claims Judaism makes upon them. Someone is actually asking what that Hebrew word for grace is. Well, the, the Hebrew word that unequivocally means grace is chen, right? When we say that God is chanun, we mean that God is gracious, not in the sort of Southern genteel way of saying, aren't you gracious, but gracious in the literal sense of giving us what we have no right to demand. Maimonides also thinks that the word chesed means grace, although that is more controversial and complicated, but chen is the unequivocal word there. And Stephanie, can I just say, I, I mean, I think when the when the book is written on the life of Rabbi Scheiheld and his contribution to our understanding of Judaism, I think that this formulation that he that you write about, Shai, in one of the chapters about grace to gratitude to generosity will be one of the most important contributions that you have made to our own self-understanding. Um, and I'm just so, I'm so grateful to you for that. I mean, I, I will, I also, I, mean, I want to say Shai and I have been friends for many, many years, but Shai was also my teacher. He was only one year ahead of me in rabbinical school, but it's precisely because of the kind of thinking that you're offering right now that I, you, I think you liberated me to think about Judaism in a different way than I did, even as a third and fourth year rabbinical student at the, at the time that we really became friends. But you, you, you have a, a certain way of um, taking a vantage point um, when looking at Jewish tradition and text and theology that's just different from the in the weeds vantage point that that often I think imprisons us in in wrongheaded ideas about who we are and what our limitations are and I think we become habituated to those lim limitations and you're essentially liberating us from them and saying why don't we zoom out and try to understand what's actually going on here and so I I just feel very grateful to you for that. And I think that this particular progression is one of the most powerful articulations of who we are and who we're called to be. Can you show everyone your copy of Shai's book? <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally nerded out on this book, but I am an active reader generally. Um, so I did this also to Ron Lieber's book, um, The Opposite of Well. But I do this, I do this with books that I love, but but really almost, I mean, every page has multiple tabs here and there's just so much. Um, beauty in here and and we're very we're just very fortunate that it's that it's finally all um in one concise text here and that word finally is a very important one because books take a long time to come yeah. out into the world there's the conceptualization which it sounds like starts in like almost sermons for you and conversations and and, and talks then there's the writing the book and then it goes to edit there's a lot a lot that happens um in all books, not just books like this, where there are 150 pages of notes, um, <laughs> I, but it just, it's a long process. And so, you know, they've, the books have come out in a different world than I imagine they were written in a very different moment, a unique moment, a scary moment, and a very important moment. So I guess my question to you is, you know, you're both talking, you know, you're both sort of everywhere, right, talking about these books in a very specific moment. So I guess, how does what is in these books help us or guide us in what really feels like a, an unprecedented moment? And I will say before you answer that there are links to buy both books right in the chat right now. Um, so you could just open that link for later um, or do it now while they're talking. Um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here, Stephanie, and say, um, you know, I closed this manuscript a year before October 7th, basically, almost a full year. Um, I really 
when I, when I went into the um, audio booth to record the audiobook in November, um, a couple months before it came out, I was absolutely terrified because I knew that I wrote the book in a different world. And I knew that I wrote the book from a totally different vantage point. I was a person who thankfully for most of my life had sort of entered the sacred space and turned to the right and circled counterclockwise and kept my gaze up and looked to see who the brokenhearted were and how I could reorient my time here on earth around the needs of the brokenhearted. And um, I really wrote the book from that vantage point. That's where my heart was. Then my father died. Then October 7th happened. And so I went into that audio booth, really reading the book as someone turning to the left, both personally and now part of a collective of people that mo many of us were turning to the left and circling in the other direction. And I was terrified because I thought, you know, this book, I wrote it during a sabbatical that was just a few months, but I've been, I've been working on this book for 20 years in my head and in my sermons and in my heart. And I worried that it didn't matter anymore, that it wouldn't apply to this new reality that we were in. And as I was reading, I realized that actually the, that the, the wisdom of the book was exactly the wisdom that I needed now as a novella, as a person walking in the other direction. And it's because it's not mine. It's ancient. It's, I mean, I'm really trying to draw from the sources from 2000 years ago, how they were inviting us to hold all different realities of the human condition. And the rabbis did not only write from the perspective of those who were doing okay that day and going up on their, you know, on their um, pilgrimage, they were also writing from the, from the other direction. And so I found it incredibly comforting and then the book came out, you know, in January and I've been, tra you know, traveling and speaking for the last several months to a, you know, to a population that's really broken and really vulnerable, full of sorrow and anguish. Many people have been asking what happens when you're turning to the left and nobody's there to receive you from the right. What do you do when the people who you feel like you stood with and captured and, and caught and, and held with love for many years, all of a sudden you're in pain and they ghost you? You know, it's as if you don't exist. And we're having these incredibly painful and powerful conversations about tribalism and universalism and the limits of how hard, how how broad our um, the scope of our moral concern can actually extend. Can we see one another when we ourselves are in acute trauma and anguish and sorrow and how do we reorient our hearts toward curiosity when we're in pain and when the people who are coming maybe they maybe they aren't even coming toward us but they're coming at us and so we feel under uh, under siege can we still hold curiosity and compassion and care so in a way i thought i was writing this book for a different world than the book than the world that the book came into but i realized that it's exactly the wisdom that I've needed and exactly the framework for the conversation that so many of us have, have found as kind of a guiding light or, or, or force for, for some kind of spiritual strength during this time. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. Yeah, so, you know, in a way, my experience is similar. Um, the galleys of my book arrived at my home on Shabbat morning, October 14th. And I remember very distinctly turning to my wife and saying, I can't imagine being less interested in this book. And it was a really crushing feeling because I had put six years of on and off intense work into this book. And then, you know, in some ways, 25 years of teaching and thinking that went into this book. And it took me four days to actually open the box of galleys, which for anyone who's written a book, you realize that that's sort of insane, right? You wait for it, you wanna see it. I, I didn't feel that way at all. And then something very interesting happened, which is that I began to share with colleagues and students how apathetic and indifferent I felt towards my book. And almost to a head, people said to me, you know, you have this exactly backwards. I wanna talk about love now more than I ever have before. And I have to be honest, that did not resonate with me at all at first. And I still have days when it doesn't resonate with me at all. But what I realized is that they were actually tapping in to this very deep source of Jewish wisdom. And that is um, a Mishnah, a rabbinic text that 
always struck me as anomalous at best and bizarre at worst. The Mishnah in Masechet Ta'anit says that the ninth of Av, what we call Tisha B'Av, right, is the saddest, most horrific day of the year. Both temples are destroyed. The generation of the Exodus finds out it will not enter the land. Everything that could go wrong does go wrong. And then, just a couple of passages later, two Mishnayot later, we hear that there were two days of the year that were the happiest, most joyous days of the year, and one of them was the 15th of Av, six days after Tisha B'Av, and the reason it was such a happy day was that people would meet and couple off. This always struck me as crazy, right? You are mourning the destruction of the temple. Quite literally, what you think is the center of the world has been raised to the ground. And you don't even wait for Shiva to be over. And you're already making Shiduchim, right? You're already like marrying off the people at the Shiva. And then sort of it occurred to me as I was working on this book that they were saying something extremely powerful, which is just in the moment when you're so traumatized that you're prepared to give up on life when you're so traumatized that you're constricted and you feel closed off inside yourself, precisely at that moment, we reaffirm love and human connection. And what these friends and students were saying when they said to me, no, we need this book and its themes now, was actually kind of a reaffirmation of the Mishnah's own logic. Just when you want to give up on love, reaffirm it. And I I don't want to be Pollyannish. I'm not suggesting that the only thing necessary in the wake of something like October 7th is love. You also have to rebuild what's been broken. You have to provide housing for people who have been displaced. You have, you know, to defend yourself from the possibility of happening again. But you are not allowed to forget about love. You are not allowed to forego human connection and commitment. And that's really, really, I think, powerful. And to the extent that many Jews now feel that they want to unapologetically and proudly embrace their Jewishness, there's no better way of doing that than going right back to the heart of Torah, to the heart of Jewish tradition, and embracing there. I thought you were going to say there's no better way than getting both of these books, but I'll say that. (laughs) Well, obviously. (laughs) Stephanie, would it be okay if I asked Sharon a question? Please, I told you I'm just going to mute myself. I'll go get a coffee or something. So I, <laughs> so I was thinking today, Sharon, about something that you wrote, and I wanted to ask you if you could maybe share some insight about this. What, I don't remember if this is consistent, but a few times in the book, you talk really movingly about the Amen effect as about ritualized presence for one another. And I wonder how much ritualized presence is what's really important to you or just raw human presence? What is the importance of ritualizing there for you? So the, I, I, the way I understand the ritualization of care is that we are training our hearts to respond in a way that is counterinstinctual. When, when somebody says a blessing and the community responds, amen, or when somebody says, yitgadal v'yikadash shemei rabah, and the community says, amen, we're engaging in a kind of mus- muscle memory. We're teaching our hearts that this person who's standing up in the room and sharing their joy or sharing their grief needs to be seen. And I have the power to see them. Maybe they're a loved one, maybe they're a stranger, but I'm just a, a person who's being pr- who's standing in the presence of somebody who's having an experience of sorrow or celebration. And I actually have the power to bear witness to them. So that's what I mean by the ritualization of care. It's sort of, it's reminding us. And and by the way, I mean, I speak about Mourner's Kaddish in, in the first chapter um, of the book. You know, I realized that par- the power of this prayer for me is not... It's not actually about the the theology of the prayer. It's not about the poetry of the prayer. It's about this this dialogue that happens between a brokenhearted person and a community that sees them in their pain and doesn't run away. And the brokenhearted person finds the courage somehow to stand up and say, I am shattered by this loss. And the community says, amen, and then amen, and then amen. We get 
five amens and a brichu in every mourner's cottage, right? It's repeated amen. And by the way, the first amen that we say comes before the mourner even finishes their first sentence. It's gadal v'kadash shemei rabah. It's not even a sentence. It's like a it's an ellipsis at the end of that. And the community is so eager to say, "We see you. We're not running away from you." That they actually interrupt the mourner to say, "Just so you know, we're here." And your pain might scare us and destabilize us and remind us of our own vulnerability. And this is especially true after traumatic loss and after really tragic loss. It's really difficult on a human level to show up for somebody who's experienced that kind of pain. And when we do, we need them to know we're here. We're not abandoning you as scary as your loss might be. And so we say, amen, 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 amen. And the message that is that is being communicated to the mourner is we are we are by your side as you grieve in the depths of this darkness we're right here, and the message that the community say, is sharing with itself is, I am not running away from the pain. I can sh I can hold this person with love in this world that makes no sense to anyone right now. The one thing I can actually do is show up at the Shiva and say amen, and not once, but again and again and again and again. And that is the deepest expression of my humanity in this moment. So it's about you, but it's also about me reminding myself of my own humanity. And by the way, someone in the comments is just saying that Kaddish seems to be so much about more about the words and then hearing that chorus of amen, and they describe it as an anchor. Um, an anchor, yeah. It's really beautiful. I actually do have a question. Do you say amen, amen, just it feels like Christians say amen. How did this happen? Does anyone know? <laughs> well, I mean, we say, we tend to say amen or um, amen in Jewish context. Christians say amen. Muslims say amen. I, part of the reason that I love this word so much is that it actually resonates in so many different traditions. And even in ancient African traditions saying asha, which is the same, which really takes essentially the same meaning. In other words, somebody is having a profound spiritual or emotional experience and a community of witnesses is saying, I see you, which I think is the very heart of our humanity, our ability to look at another person and see an image of God and see somebody whose experience who, who in their core humanity is worthy of my witness. And I think that is an incredible gift that we can give uh, to one another, a gift of affirmation. And the rabbis say that even saying amen to someone else's prayer could be considered even more powerful than saying the prayer yourself. So why why is that? Because it's actually affirming the relationship. It's refer, it's affirming that there's something there's something electric happening between these human beings that their experience is so raw and so real that I can affirm it. And that gives me the power of witness. You know, if I could just be permitted a homiletical, you know, observation here. The word amen, right? We often think of emuna as meaning faith. But actually, emunah, biblically, its first meaning is trustworthiness or faithfulness. When we call God el emunah, that means God is a God who is worthy of trust. So I, I sort of wonder whether one of the things we might mean when we say amen to someone's Kaddish is you can trust us. We really are here. But there is something really kind of amazing about that. Like, we are here. We're not just here performing a ritual obligation. We're here. We're really, really here. And that again, to go back to what I said earlier, is for rabbinic spirituality, the highest level we can achieve in this lifetime, to be someone upon whom people who are hurting can rely. And can I, I just wanna add another dimension to that. You, can tr you mourner can trust us that we're really here, but also we trust you that you're really in pain right now. And I think this is something that, especially over the last many months has become really critically important for many of us. Like, right. what does it mean when you're hurting and people around you don't believe that you're hurting, right? There's a kind of gaslighting that happens. I don't believe your pain, but I trust your pain. I trust that you are aching right now. And I'm saying amen because I see that you are brokenhearted right now. So the trust is actually multi-directional here. So before I get to questions, I just have 
I would love for the two of you, because you are both leading really, really interesting and, and important Jewish institutions. And I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about Ikar and Hadar, just because I feel like people here probably want more of, of both of you. So I would love it if you could just tell us about like your day jobs. <laughs> you want to go first? Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Um, Ikar, we're celebrating our 20th birthday. We started in the spring of 2004 um, with a small group of founders. Um, I mean, par I came out to LA as a young, um, idealistic, earnest rabbi. I think I described myself as inexhaustible in those days. So, um, but really, I wanted to be in a Jewish community that I would be proud to raise children in. And I, that meant that it had to be really aligned with my core Jewish values. It had to be spiritually alive. And it had to understand that the depth of our encounter with these, with this ancient Jewish wisdom, with these core Jewish ideas, would not only serve our own souls and spirits, but would actually reverberate out and help us build a more just and loving society. And so we built the community um, and it's been really quite extraordinary um, to witness its growth. I mean, now it's a community that's with people from all around the world. We have uh, folks from Tokyo who are with us in Morning Minion every single day. Um, they just actually flew in for their once a year annual Ikar encounter. Um, but it's a really it's a really extraordinary community of of creative and passionate and and wise um, and wise seekers and. Um, and it's been a great, it's been a great privilege and, and joy to be, to help build uh, and kind of usher this thing into the world over the, over the course of the last 20 years. So about Hadar, I'll give you kind of first a formal answer and then a much more personal one. Hadar was started with two goals in mind. One is to lay a stake in the ground for the full integration of deep commitment and immersion in tradition and gender equality, to see that as an and rather than a but. And at the same time, to serve as a resource for and be a conversation partner for the entirety of the Jewish world across the denominational spectrums. We made a very conscious choice not to carve out some thin ideological slice. Oh, you're between JTS and YCT. We did not wanna do that at all. And I'm very proud of the fact that you know, I have the privilege of teaching hundreds of reform rabbis on a regular basis and YU graduates. So it's been very, very important to us on the one hand to articulate a vision of Jewish life that we believe in, and at the same time to insist that we belong to and belong with the entirety of the Jewish people. And we now also have a, a constantly growing and expanding presence in Israel as well, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Be'er Sheva. It's been really quite inspiring process. On a personal level, what I would say Hadar was for me from the very beginning was an attempt to build the Beit Midrash, the study hall that I felt I had spent my whole life looking for but never found. A Beit Midrash that had all the passion of a traditional place of learning with all of the openness of a more liberal place of learning. And a place that insisted that you could be totally committed to Torah and never allow yourself to use Torah as a bludgeon with which to hurt other people. I mm. committed to myself, you know, the moment we started, that there would never be a human experience that we would rule out of hand and say that experience has no place in the conversation of Torah, right? I had just seen an experience in my own flesh, the ways that religion can be used to hurt people, to silence them, to humiliate them. And although I'm sure we have failed, you know, plenty of times, that's the kind of lodestar um, of a kind of humanistic, deeply theological vision of the world. Yeah, I mean, some there's a there's a lot of alignment between our um, our two projects, even though they're very different. Um, one's more Beit Knesset and one's more Beit Midrash, I think. But um, but there's also a lot of consistency in the approach here. I mean, ours is also really non-denominational, and the goal here is to try to have a conversation um, about what is asked of us in a time of moral crisis as Jews. And that's a conversation that should really resonate to people from whatever their, you know, their hashkafa or whatever. I mean, some people drive for two hours to come to services on Shabbos morning, and some people would only walk even in the pouring rain, not that it ever really rains here. Um, and so there's this kind of broad diversity of Jewish practice, but 
um, but a shared commitment to trying to really understand um, how to live as a as a Jew and how to live as a person in the world today, given all of the immense human suffering and the incredible beauty and possibility of this world. So I'm gonna. I'm going to pivot to our audience questions. They fall into sort of two themes. And I'm going to like ask you basically like a, 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 a mishmash of, um, of questions at once, just that are on theme. We have a few questions of like, what, what are the Hebrew words for love? You know, a lot of languages have lots of words for that. What are some of the, the words that have been used in Hebrew and Jewish learning? Um, how did the Talmud define a broken heart um, in Midot? What did, how did they, what do they, how do they call it? And then, um, also, just this question of how do we help our children feel the reciprocity of love? Um, this the right the the question writer writes: I love Bubby and Zadie, and they love me. I love Taylor Swift, but she doesn't love me. So how do we, in seeing you know, how do we move God's love from the page to this warm embrace that we really really need? So I think that's all um, the love based sort of questions. Um. So Sharon, if it's okay, maybe I'll jump in here first. Um, you know. The Jewish tradition has had a variety of words for love. I, I, I want to emphasize two of them. One is the word chesed, which in the Bible means faithful love. It's not just love and it's not just faithfulness. It's faithful love. It's steady love, love that endures, love that is reliable, to go back to that term emunah, love that is truly faithful. Um, so that is that is one piece now for the rabbinic tradition chesed comes to mean acts of loving kindness for people who are in vulnerable situations and i have found it helpful to use the word loving kindness which sounds so archaic it makes people think of calling god thou and all of those kinds of things but if you reinsert the space between loving and kindness and you understand chesed as love manifested in acts of kindness, then you get a sense of Judaism's vision of integrating the internal and the external, right? The, the ideal is I care for you and I care for you because I care about you, right? So there's a full integration of emotion and action. Another word obviously is ahav, um, which has had a whole array of meanings over time ranging from passional love to parental love um, to a whole bunch of, of, of kind of options in between. I think that um, it's probably worth saying that rabbinic Hebrew has no way to distinguish compassion and love. And this I find incredibly moving, right? The Aramaic word for, lo for love is racham, right? The same word in Hebrew for mercy, rachamim. And so we can understand compassion as a species of love, which is, I think, really important and speaks to the themes both of Sharon's book and of mine. It's about deep presence in care for other people. Um, the, the, uh, sorry, I, Stephanie, I just lost. The second part of the question was... Oh, like parasocial relationships that people have now. How do we like return to the groundedness that you you really advocate for? Um... Well, you know, there's a really interesting paradox, which is on the one hand, we say that God loves us unconditionally. And on the other hand, at the same time, the only way we can learn to feel that is if other people mediate God's love for us. Tell a child who's been verbally abused by their parent that God loves them and you're not going to get very far. And so I think one of the things that is necessary as a spiritual practice of parenting is, if you will, to make it believable to children that God really cares about them. One of the things that I, I write about in my book that you know I used to do with my kids and was very, very important to me is I would, every couple of weeks, sit each of my kids down and say, you know, I love you so much that I can't even begin to describe how much I love you. I don't even really understand it myself. But I want you to know something. As much as I love you, love you, Hashem, God, loves you even more. And the reason that I would say that is because I knew that despite my best intentions, there were times when I would let my kids down and I would give them the impression that my love for them was conditional. And I wanted to point beyond myself to say, there is someone in this universe who loves you always without condition and no matter what. That God loves you with expectations but without conditions. 
that I think is just really powerful as a vision for sort of what religion could do to enable us to become lovers. God loves us so that we in turn can be lovers ourselves. And that's very different than like the gray bearded man who's angry all the time. That's the perception that a lot of us get when we're young. That's more Christian yeah. anti-Judaism internalized, I would say. I can address the question about how the rabbis of the Mishnah understood brokenheartedness. Um, the 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 way that it's written in the text is Misha Erodavar. Um, by the way, I have this, I put together this little source booklet of, um, there's a safari source sheet for each chapter and some chapters have two or even three of them so that they're designed to be kind of over a dinner or a one hour study together with some guided questions that Rabbi Deborah Silver and I came up with. Um, so folks can feel free to go on Safari and find them if you want. Um, but in the Mishnah, there are two, there are two examples of what Misha Erodavar is, someone to whom something had happened. The first is the Avel, which is the mourner. And I really extrapolate from the category of the mourner to be anyone who's brokenhearted. That's my language. Um, and that is born of my pastoral instinct. Um, just experiencing the end of a marriage, the end of a relationship, the kinds of transitions that cause great pain um, to people that um, that sometimes there's no burial plot for them, but there's a there's a significant loss, um, the death of a dream, the end of a dream. Um, and so I speak through most of the book about that first example, um, not just the explicitly the mourner, but somebody who's um, broken hearted and bereft. Um, the second example that's brought in the Mishnah is someone called the Menudeh. The Menudeh is somebody who's um, who in the ancient world was put into a very particular form of punishment that's one step short of excommunication. They're put into Nidui when they've caused grave harm to the community or to individuals in the community. And we are essentially called the community to socially distance from them. We don't we don't engage them socially in any way. You don't invite them for Shabbos dinner. Um, you avoid them when you see them out in public. It even says that you're not supposed to go within six feet of the people who are in Nidui. And yet that example is the second example that the Mishnah brings of Misha Erodavar, someone to whom something had happened. And what's really shocking and extraordinary about this text and this tradition is that, um, is that they too, they who we avoid when we see them on the street, are called up to the Beit HaMikdash, to this sacred place on the sacred days. And they walk in the direction of the brokenhearted. They walk in the same direction as the mourners. And we don't sidestep them, avoid them, avert our eyes. We actually look at them and see them in their humanity. And here, I just I, I just think of the words of Brian Stevenson, every person is more than the worst thing they've ever done. And we, in that moment, see them not as an ostracized person, but as a human being. And that we ask them with with a with a real open hearted curiosity. Tell me about your heart. What happened to you, Malach? Tell me um, what you see from your vantage point. And so I really extrapolate from that um, that we're called to not only see the humanity of the people who are broken hearted, who are around us, who we might naturally be inclined to see the humanity in because they've just been through something really terrible and hard. But even the people who've caused us pain or caused people we love pain, how can we see their humanity too? So there's one final theme of the question that um, is probably the most prevalent in our in our um, audience Q and A, which is basically what's going on right now. Um, it feels to be the most urgent part of this conversation. Um, and there's questions like, what advice do you have for parents of college students? You know, how do we support our kids and our students as they walk through graffiti and yelling and chaos that is driving them towards tribalism? And then another question that's saying, you know, since October 7th, my sense of compassion reaches out to both peoples. Consequently, I'm feeling alienation from both sides. Um, do you have any thoughts about being in that middle? And then there are questions about having supported other groups and feeling that lack of compassion back towards Jews. So I guess I want to ask how you guide us in this moment, um, both of you, what we can learn, how we can how we can use the the lessons of your book to to sort of be the best versions of ourselves in this moment. Sharon, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I'll tr I'll try this. Um. So first of all, I, tribalism is is very much a part of the human condition. It's very natural and actually very healthy 
for us to connect with people who we think are like us in some fundamental ways. Either they look like us, talk like us, vote like us, pray like us. This is a this is a, a very natural human reaction. Um, and of course, we know that you know we need tribes in order to survive. That none of us you know can actually survive alone. And so, finding people with whom we can be in community is really essential. What I found most astonishing in my research as I was, you know, as I've been writing this, as I wrote the book is that we now know that the depth of one's connection to her own tribe correlates to the depth of indifference or hostility that that person will have to people outside of her tribe. So, I mean, this is, this is actually quite striking. The more connected I am to my tribe, the more hostile or indifferent, I feel to people who are not part of my tribe. So this is when when the, the healthy, beautiful part of tribal communal connection actually becomes incredibly toxic and dangerous for us. And it ends up resulting in this kind of choice that people are making to see the humanity in the people who are in our tribe, however we define our tribe, and really to diminish the humanity of those who are outside. You know, I think I've heard Shai describes this as a kind of a particularistic universalism that we're supposed to strive for. On Ezra Klein last week, he he was I, I was described as a, a universal tribalism, like we're all kind of grasping for language that will describe an alternative to the 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 dehumanization that comes from investing too deeply in our tribes so that it becomes only in our tribes. And I think that part of what's happening in this moment is that different people in our Jewish community are identifying our tribes differently. For some, their tribe is their Jewish tribe. And the depth of their connection to the Jewish story and to Jewish suffering and to Jewish pain is leading to a kind of dehumanization, frankly, of people who are outside of our Jewish community, especially Palestinian people. For others, they define their tribe as people who see the world like they do, which often alienates them from their Jewish community, which they see by and large not seeing the world the way that they do. And they'll identify that as their tribe. And it leads for some of them to actually to the dehumanization of their own Jewish family. And so you'll see a kind of diminishing of the suffering that happens in one of these places or the other. What we're all kind of grasping for language around right now is how to stake a claim on a heart that is capacious enough to hold love for our own family and for our own people while also holding love for the, for the human family and especially for those who are suffering most profoundly, especially when there are neighbors who are suffering most profoundly. And, and, and I think I know that that's possible. And so the person who asked this question, who said, I am trying to hold a heart in both of these, uh, both in both of these places, but feel increasingly isolated. The reason that we who try to hold both of those truths feel isolated is because we are essentially living in a time where they're warring camps. Now they're literally protesters and counter protesters, their ideological opponents and both of them, to some extent, are engaging in a game of tribalization where the depth of their connection to their people is so strong that it could be leading to the dehumanization of the other. And it feels isolating to say, wait a minute, you're both right. You're both right, because both of you are speaking from pain and anguish and sorrow, and I see it in both of you. And I just keep coming back to something that Julia Yaffe wrote back in October, where she said she increasingly feels like she's on an island that is drifting further and further away from the mainland. And she feels so isolated from, from witnessing the discourse degrade to such a point that if you actually affirm the humanity of both your Jewish family and Palestinian human beings who are suffering immensely in Gaza, then there's no room for you here. And, and I realized as I read her words that she's feeling profoundly lonely, but actually she's not alone on that island because I'm on the same island that she's on. And so are some of the best people I know in this world. And so is the person who just asked that question. And so is Rabbi Shai Held. And so are so many of us. In fact, I think most of us are on that island where we are trying desperately to hold on to and affirm the humanity 
of all of the people who are suffering immensely in this time and not give more credence or more weight to the sorrow of one people or another. And I believe that ultimately, the only way that we're going to be able to heal individually and collectively is when we allow ourselves to see and to affirm and to love the humanity of the people who are in our tribe and the people who are outside the bounds of that tribe. Shai Held, want to have the last word of the evening? How am I supposed to follow that? So <laughs> let me actually just um, say a couple of quick things because I endorse everything Sharon said. Um, perhaps a little more kind of abstractly, I would say Jewish ethics consistently chooses to work with the grain of nature rather than against it. And the grain of nature is such that we love those who are closest to us. The idea that we can love every person in the world equally is a prescription to ending up loving no one at all in particular. The challenge is how do we allow the love we feel in our most intimate relationships to enable, empower, and challenge us to love more broadly than that? Right? And so there's always the risk that family first devolves into family only. And it's an especial risk when your family legitimately and rightly feels besieged. So it's a really difficult moment. You can't give up on family first. That's what it means to be a human being. But you can't settle for family only because that's an excuse for brutalizing and, and, you know, and sort of dehumanizing everyone else around you, right? You know, you see yourself as the center of the world and no one else matters. You know, I, I think maybe I, I would close this evening by sharing something that has been a bit of a kind of like guiding light for me. Um, there was a Israeli member of parliament named Moshe Una, who was amazingly enough, a member of Knesset from the National Religious Party and the founder of the religious Zionist peace movement, right? That in itself is worth taking a minute to internalize, right? The National Religious Party, the party of Ben Gvir and Smotrich, the, the Haver Knesset, or you know, one of the Haver Knesset, one of the members of parliament from that party in the 1980s was a man who had founded a peace movement. And in one of his speeches, Moshe Una, who was in German Ole, um, he has this totally beautiful idea where he says, there are two aspects to educating for our heritage. First, first, we have to teach our kids about our own love for this place, all the things that it means to us, the ways that it is the place where we can fulfill God's commands, the ways it is the place where our ancestors roamed, the ways that Jewish longing has been for this place. But then he says, or I should say, and then he says, but there's a second aspect to chinuch lamoledet, to education for our heritage. And that is to get our kids to understand that another people feels the very same way about this land. I find that to be so arrestingly beautiful in its simplicity. And we are, I think what one of the things that's so painful is we are farther away now, it feels like, from that than we have been in a very long time. But it remains true. If we want the land of Israel to one day be less soaked with blood, we will have to find a way for both peoples to recognize one another. And unfortunately, that is not a voice you hear right now, right? When you hear either, you know, that Palestinians are whatever they are, or that we need to bring an end to Israel. The, the, that's precisely about showing no empathy for one another's stories. And ultimately, as hard as it is, as countercultural as it is, empathy is actually the only way forward. The question is just when, not whether. That's a beautiful note to end on. Empathy is the only way forward. I'm so grateful to the two of you for having this conversation, for sharing your wisdom with us. There was a, a comment in the chat that I just want, want to share. They, someone wrote, thank you for both these books. They offer great comfort during these extremely painful times. And I think this conversation did too. Um, so thank you, Rabbi Sharon Browse, Rabbi Shai Held for, for being here with us tonight. Um, thank you, Stephanie. And I also want to thank everyone who's been with us for any one of the three uh, Jewish uh, Unpacking the Book events in this series. I want to thank Jenna and the Jewish Museum and Evi, Naomi, and Miri and the Jewish Book Council for being such amazing partners on this. And again, my gratitude to the two of you and to everyone who showed up here tonight.
Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie and Sharon. Thank you, Sharon.